Let's talk about universal joints. It, not exactly the most interesting or stimulating topic in the world of cars, but we've all got them in common. And after reading through the comments on the last video we did on driveline setup and angularity and the causes and effects, I realized that there's a lot of bad information, misinformation, old wives' tales concerning the universal joint that I think we need to get into. So this is more or less a continuation of the last video we did, and this time I have a chart that'll better illustrate the principles that I was trying to explain. But let's talk about the U-joint and some of the comments and some of the misinformation that, that came across in that last video. So a couple of guys said that if you set up everything in a dead straight line, and we said that the optimum setup for the least amount of parasitic loss, the least amount of vibration, and we're going to get into parasitic loss and vibration in a minute, you want to have everything set up in a dead straight line. So for a cruiser, something that's just that, that you drive, or everything should, in theory, be straight. Now, in theory is important. We're going to get to that in a minute also. So a couple of guys says, well, it'll vibrate. If you've got everything in a straight line, it'll vibrate. And that's not true. Assuming that all of the parts in the loop are up to snuff. So meaning that the tail shaft bushing is good in the transmission. The front yoke is good. Both U-joints are good. The pinion bearing is good. The drive shaft doesn't have any defects. It doesn't have any bends in it. It's not imbalanced or anything like that. Then setting everything up in that theoretically perfect straight line cannot possibly cause vibration. Now, it can cause vibration if you've got slop in the system. So, example. Let's say you've got a worn tail shaft bushing in the transmission. When you take the angularity away from the dry shaft and you allow it to just freely spin, the slop that's in the tail shaft bushing will let the yoke move around and you'll get a vibration. So in other words, it won't spin completely true. If you add some angularity to it, you'll create a, a, a minor bind between the yoke and the tail shaft bushing and that'll hold it steady you won't get the vibration. But again, see, that's only if there's a defect. In a perfect world with perfect parts, a straight line is the best possible way to do it. When you've got everything in a straight line, there's no, there's no angularity to the drive shaft or to the drive train. There's no parasitic loss of vibration. Now, you get parasitic loss of vibration through U-joint just through its, its basic nature by its design and the example the best example to give you this to give you on this is a swivel socket so a swivel socket is essentially a u-joint they're they're a slightly different than a u-joint in that they're, they're staggered the pivot points are staggered on these but the principle is the same when you take a swivel joint and let's say you put on a long socket and you're going to get a, a fastener you're going to go for a fastener when you operate these things at minor angles, they're fine. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. But the more of an angle that you need to put this on, the harder you have to push against it to keep it from wanting to walk off the fastener. And if you've got a real severe angle on this, you can't push it hard enough. As soon as you apply twist, as soon as you turn the ratchet, this thing just wants to jump right off the fastener. Well, that same exact principle applies when you're dealing with a universal joint. When it's operated at an angle, it wants to push away. What it's, what it's doing is, as it's spinning, as it's going through its cycle, it's speeding up and slowing down the drive shaft in relation to the part that it's driving or, or it's being driven by, which is a transmission, or the part that it's driving, the rear end. So the transmission wants to spin smoothly, the rear end wants to spin smoothly, but the drive shift, the more angle you put in there, the more it's going to speed up and slow down. It's a bind that happens, and it's just the nature of the beast. And in small degrees, it's okay, it's acceptable, you'll never see it, you'll never, you'll never pick up on that vibration. It's only when you start to get to severe angles or bad angles where that vibration becomes excessive. Now, the other thing that people talked about was lubrication. If you've got everything in a straight line, the rollers aren't moving, and so the grease isn't being circulated, and so the, the joint will wear prematurely. That would be true if there was no dynamic movement 
to a car's suspension. So as you're going down the road, unevenness in the road, bumps, uh, application, and, and you put power to the rear end, take power away from the rear end, the pinions moving up and down in relation to that. There's always slight movement. And the fact is that even if you set up the car with the driveline completely dead straight, let's say static is just sitting there, as soon as you put your weight in the car and it comes down a little bit, you're inducing a little bit of angularity to the shaft. Now, how much angularity do you actually need to keep the rollers moving and everything satisfied as far as lubrication goes? According to Spicer, and this has to do with stationary drive shafts, not even something that's in a car, but something that's a piece of stationary machinery that you've, you, you've got a drive shaft and you're using universal joints as couplers. According to Spicer, you need one half of one degree of angularity to the shaft in order to keep the rollers moving. So even if you set up your car, let's say with everything in a dead straight line, it's always going to be moving around to a point that you've got that one half of one degree angularity moving to keep the rollers moving and, and the lubrication going. I imagine that if you jumped on a dead straight flat interstate and stayed at an exact steady cruise for like a thousand miles, yeah, you probably destroy the bearings. But beyond that, just normal use, no, it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. So dead straight is the perfect theoretical thing. Now let's go to this chart. And this is nothing special about this chart. It's just one variation of, there's like a hundred of them on there. I just picked this one because it was, it was clear. So here's what we're talking about with this. Perfectly in line, right? Low strain, no vibration. Clearly, there's, there's nothing to strain, there's nothing to vibrate. Now, if you start with this, if you shoot for this, you end up in the real world with this. And if you look under just about any production car, truck, whatever, this is essentially what you're going to find. Angularity, more or less like this. The input shaft and the output shaft are in the same plane with each other, and the drive shaft got just a little bit of angularity. With a couple of degrees, as it is being shown here, you're not going to sense any real vibration. That speeding up and slowing down of the drive shaft in reaction to the universal joint isn't going to be enough for you to actually pick up, you know, to feel. And so here they got this listed as moderate strain, minimal vibration. And that is about the normal setup that you're going to find. So if you shoot for this, you're going to end up with some variation of this. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Now you get down to this. This is, this is something that we talked about for a drag or an acceleration-oriented car, where you tilt the pinion down a couple of degrees and so that when power is applied to it, and this is especially true at leaf spring cars, as the power is applied to it, the pinion raises. So this is the setup you would have, let's say, static. Car is just sitting. Now when you accelerate, the pinion stands up, and this becomes this. And that's why you really only want to set a car up like this for dra you know, drag racing. is about the only application where you would want it. You would seek this kind of arrangement, because that under power becomes that, and then when the power is released, it goes back to that. And here it's saying high strain bad vibration. And that really depends on the degrees, the number of degrees that you're tilting the pinion down. At that three degree range that we talked about, you're generally not going to find any, any real vibration there. You go beyond three degrees and you'll start to get that vibration and that strain. So just keep that in mind as, as you're going through this. Now here we've got this setup. This is, this is the common setup to like lifted trucks and badly conceived like gasser type of cars, right? We, things aren't really thought through. And here you go, this is, you know, absolutely not. Do not do this, right? Incredible strain, ridiculous vibration, poor pinion vibration. Well, okay, they're talking about pinion vibration. Forget about that. This will tear the hell out of your tail shift bushing. So you want to avoid this at all possible costs. Making it simple, shoot for that live with that do this only under certain circumstances yeah don't okay so i think that covers pretty much everything as far as angularity's effect on the universal joint but let's just talk about the universal joints 
wait, even before that, let's talk about constant velocity joints, because that's something I wanted to throw in there also. When we think CV joint, you think of a front wheel drive car. And the purpose of a CV joint, constant velocity, as opposed to a universal joint, which isn't constant velocity. The purpose of a constant velocity joint is to transmit the power smoothly and evenly from the driving part, the transmission, the axle, and the wheel as it turns. So that regardless of what angle it's on, the power is transmitted smoothly. Remember with a universal joint, the more the angle, the less smooth the, the transfer of power. So there's a couple of versions of this. It's automotive CV joints. This was a very common one. This was, this was the standard Chrysler setup until 1964 was the last year for this. And other manufacturers used this too. This was a very common deal. This is called a ball and trunnion. So on the back, you've got a standard U-joint. But on the front here, you've got this setup. And I don't, I'm not going to take this apart because there's all grease in here and it's just be an unholy mess. But I can describe what goes on here. So from the drive shaft, you've got a shaft that comes up through the center of this. Just a steel shaft. And in that steel shaft is a cross shaft. And attached to either end of the cross shaft and riding in these channels are balls, steel balls. They're just a big ball bearing that's attached to that cross shift. And what that does is that allows it, this thing to operate at any angle with no loss or vibration through the shaft. The downside to these, the reason why manufacturers got away from these, aside from the complexity, the manufacturing cost of something like this, is because without maintenance, they, they go away pretty quickly. These things have a, supposed to have a rubber boot this one doesn't have it, but it's supposed to have a rubber boot that goes from here to here to seal all the grease in. And in just a short period of time, that boot would rip, you know, three years, five years, eight years down the road, the boot would rip, it would fatigue, the grease would come out, and people would just drive these things until they started vibrating and making all kinds of crazy racket. So that was the one issue with them. And then the other problem in a performance application is that that cross shift that runs through here and holds two ball bearings is a weak link. When you really put the suds to one of these things, it will shear those, those, the cross shaft, and that's it. This thing just spins. Doesn't, it, not powered anymore. So that's why they got away from these. A couple of reasons, but they work. They work really nicely. They're, they do provide a perfectly smooth ride through the drive shaft under, under like really crazy angles. The other type of CV joint you have on a car, and I don't have one here to illustrate, but the other type of CV joint you have is what they call a, a cardon joint. So a cardon joint is set up like this. You've got your yoke, and then you've got two universal joints, and the universal joints are in a cage. They're attached in a cage. So you've got the yoke, the cage with the two U joints, and then the dry shaft itself. And this setup here it does pretty much the same as this. It provides a smooth, even, seamless transition of power from the yoke to the drive shaft. These things, you used to find these on, on luxury cars, higher end cars, where they wanted like zero vibration no matter what. This is what you would find. Uh, nothing special about them, but that is another form of CV joint. Okay. Now, the universal joint itself, this is something I, I never see people talk about, but this is important to know with the universal joint. When you install these in a regular passenger car, so in other words, it's, it's, it's not a race car or anything like that. You're just driving this thing. It's not a hot rod. It doesn't matter how you install this, okay? But when you put this in a high-performance car, and especially, especially either a stick car or something with a trans brake, you always want to make sure that that Zerk fitting is under compression. So most, the vast majority of universal joints have the Zerk fitting here in, in the, the main body of it. Some of them will have the Zerk fitting at the end of one of the cups. Either way, it, the purpose is to fill the passages inside with grease. But why I say that you want to have this installed on a hot rod, you want to have this installed in a state of compression, is because as the dry shift, now let's, let's talk about a clockwise rotation from where we're looking. If you attach the dry shift to these 
two cups. And the driven part, the yolk to these two cups, what happens is this is trying to separate. It's trying to pull the joint apart at the hole for the zerk fitting. When you install these in a high performance application, you want to have the drive, the driving part, the drive shaft attached here so that it's pushing this way and compressing the hole for the zerk fitting. This, that's how your joints explode. When you've, you've got these things set up so that it's being driven by these and it's separating here. So this is on the drive shaft, this is on the rear end. Drive shaft is twisting it, it's pulling it apart here. And because these cross shafts are hollow for the, for the grease passages inside, it'll separate. That's how they come apart. Not a big deal with a regular car or an automatic car, but like I said, you get into a trans brake or you get into a, a clutch, yeah, super important. And one other thing, and it's, this isn't really U-joint related, but it's, it's, it's in the family, right? So if you've got a hot rod, you got a kind of car where you, you take it apart frequently. So let's say you do gear changes or you, know, you, you put, you're pulling a transmission out of it often, right? That type of thing. Most rear yokes are set up they're drilled in tapia. They're drilled for a quarter 20 bolts. Usually they're, they're fine thread quarter 20 bolts. All of your Chrysler products, most of your Fords, a lot of the GM cars have that setup where the yoke is drilled and tapped for those bolts. Some of the higher performance cars and, and general, a lot of GM cars have, have a, 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 a U-bolt that'll go through here. If you're dealing with a Chrysler and you've, you've got those screw in bolts, do yourself a favor, okay? Drill these things out. Just just drill them all the way out, okay? And replace those screwing bolts with long quarter 20 bolts. You could use the, st the regular standard strap, but run them through and not unbolt them like that. Trust me when I tell you, after, after a certain number of cycles of tightening and loosening, these things, the fine thread bolts that they use from the factory, the, you're either going to cross thread it the threads will start to get weird. You'll snap the head off the bolt, just, just normal tightening and loosening. Trust me when I say you'll, you'll thank me a hundred times over. If you take, if you have a car that you take apart and put back together again often, the drive shifts in and out of it often, do this to it and, and never have another problem. All right, so I think I covered pretty much everything I wanted to talk about in new joints. Of course, in the comments, other people are going to bring up a thousand things that I missed or I neglected, or I, but that's okay. That's why we have comments. That's why that's the difference between you know watching TV and actually doing YouTube. You know because it's interactive. So if you have anything you want to throw in there, anything I overlooked, anything you want to add to it, throw it in the comments. And if it's if there's enough uh, momentum to it, we'll do a follow-up video. All right. So I hope you guys got something out of that, and I'll see you tomorrow.